I invite you to remain standing as today we read from the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John, these holy words. After these things, Jesus, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered, no. He said to them, cast your net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now there were, they were not able to haul in it because there were so many fish. This is the word of God for the people of God. We again say a word of greeting this morning to all of you. We're so glad you're here. We appreciate very much your presence, those here in the sanctuary as well as those watching on television and online. We say a special word of greeting to those in Hot Springs, Hot Springs Village, Houston, Texas, Places across the state of Arkansas where our homebound reside, those in our hospitals and nursing facilities as well. We're grateful to have all of you. Now, I want you all to know that today is Dr. Hampton's last Sunday, not period, but it is Dr. Hampton's last Sunday with us for the next four months. He is going to be on sabbatical. He is going to be traveling, doing research to write a book, and it is his time away. He has been here for a long, long time. He is ready for a much needed rest and an opportunity to do some good research and study. So we want to remind you that when Dr. Hampton is on sabbatical, he is on sabbatical. That means that you do not contact him. If you have a pastoral care need, Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church will still be here even when Dr. Hampton is not, which is hard to imagine, but that will be the case. So if you have a pastoral care need, please let us know. We will take care of it accordingly. But we do want to say a word of appreciation and thanks. And Dr. Hampton, we wish you the best over the next four months as you enjoy your time. Just very quickly, we want to remind you that obviously we do not have a choir today. We appreciate Seth, a beautiful, beautiful song that he sang earlier in our service of worship. But the choir, again, is in Fayetteville today. I don't think it's fair. We had the Fayetteville folks come here. I thought that was good enough. I don't know why our choir had to go up there and respond accordingly, but they did. They're not with us. They'll be back next week. But we appreciate very much the wonderful music we've had today as well. And Sun Young's playing, of course, is always beautiful. We want to remind you again that this Wednesday we have a service of worship at six o'clock in Wesley Hall. It closes out our Wednesday evening Bible studies in small groups. It's going to be a great time of worship and we hope that you'll consider being a part of that. Just show up at six o'clock. We'll worship our God together. Again, we're grateful for your presence today. Let us pray. Oh Lord, in the silence of this moment, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word for us this day and work your will in our lives. Amen. I am not by any stretch of the imagination mechanically inclined. I don't like to change even air filters in our house because it's a little complicated for me to do that. I don't have any interest in tinkering with machinery or working on a car engine or any of those kinds of things. But when I was newly married and when we first had children, I was forced to do something I did not want to do. And that was to put together toys and bicycles and swing sets. And I was never in a good mood when I had to do that. And to make matters worse, when I would lay out all the items that needed to be put together to eventually make a swing set or put together a bicycle or some kind of complicated toy, my wife Susan would mess it up. Because I would be off by myself and I would say, shucks or darn it, 
two or three times, which would cause her to come into the area where I was working, having laid all of those items out, and she would have the audacity. Now, can you imagine a wife saying this to a husband? She would have the audacity to say to me, have you thought about looking at the instructions? Which would just fly all over me. I got this. Leave me alone, please. And eventually, after all the shucks and darnets, I would look at the instructions and suddenly it became that much easier, less stressful. Why didn't I do that to begin with? I don't know. Several weeks ago, we went to see our grandchildren in North Carolina. Susan and I rented a car. Shortly after we got into the car, we recognized on the screen that one of the tires was very low, dangerously low. The air pressure, I thought, was so low that we might have a flat tire pretty quickly. So we eventually arrived at a little self-serve gas station, and they had an air pump there. It didn't even cost any money. It was the fanciest thing I had ever seen. So I went over to the air pump, and when I grabbed the valve, the nozzle, it suddenly clicked on. I put it down on the tire after unscrewing the little cap, and I waited and I waited, and nothing was happening. There was a little gauge, and I could notice there was no air going into the tire, and I got frustrated, and I said, this darn thing doesn't work. And Susan said, it does work, John. And I said, no, it doesn't. She said, why don't you see if there are some instructions? And I said, I know what I'm doing. I know how to put air in a tire for crying out loud. So I waited, and I waited, and still nothing. It was clearly broken. And suddenly and dramatically, I noticed there were some instructions on how to use that device. And once I did it, literally in a matter of about four seconds, the tire was aired up and it stopped automatically where the tire should stop. Now, why didn't I just look at the instructions to begin with? Why did I have to go through the hassle and the frustration of trying to believe I could do this all by myself? For many of us in life, we recognize that we have instructions for how to live, who we're supposed to be, how we behave, how we relate to God, how we relate to each other. And yet oftentimes we ignore the very instructions that would make life more pleasant, easier, and certainly enable us to get through some of the difficult times to a much greater degree with stronger sense of purpose. A long time ago, the disciples, after Jesus was resurrected, but before he ascended to the Father, decided to go fishing. And they are seasoned fishermen. It's what they do for a living. They know how to fish. They know what it entails and what's involved with it. But for whatever reason, they had no luck that night while they were fishing. And suddenly and dramatically, Jesus appears on the shore. This is now the third time in the Gospel of John that Jesus has appeared to the disciples before he has ascended to heaven. The first time, he meets with the disciples, but Thomas is not there. The disciples then tell Thomas, you're not going to believe this. As we know, Thomas says, unless I see his hands and his side I will not believe. The second time Jesus appears, he appears to Thomas, and Thomas says to him, you are my Lord and my God. And now this third time, as Jesus sees these disciples in a boat fishing to no avail, Jesus provides instructions. He says to them, cast your net on the other side. And as soon as they do so, the hole is so great, they can't bring it in. What the disciples do is, they pay attention to our Lord. They follow his instructions. They could have easily said, hey, wait a minute, we know what we're doing. We do this for a living. We do this all the time. But instead, what they do is pay attention, follow the instructions, and as a result, they benefit significantly. We all know that in life, 
There are many times when we have to follow instructions with regard to how to live accordingly, how to be safe, how to be secure, how to relate to other people. How to do the things that we need to do we call life. It's a part of the makeup of everyday existence. We know that. Then why is it that sometimes we blatantly disregard the instructions for life that we find in Scripture, knowing that it is always edifying and always beneficial if we will follow what it is God tells us to do and who it is God tells us to be? We know there are occasions in life when we don't dispute the instructions at all. We don't negotiate. We just do it. If there is a tornado siren that goes off, we immediately find cover. That is non-negotiable. We know that. The instructions are clear. We know what we should be doing. If we're pulled over by the police, we know what we should do. We know the instructions that they provide for us or the kinds of things we should do. We don't do whatever we want when the police approach our car. If they tell us to stay in the car, we stay in the car. If they tell us to get out of the car, we get out of the car. If they want our driver's license, we give it to them. We know that we don't want a situation to escalate, and so we follow to the nth degree the instructions of law enforcement as we always should. There are times in life we know when it's important to follow instructions. If we are in a high-rise building and the fire alarm goes off and suddenly there is something on the speaker that says evacuate, exit the building, exit the building, we're going to do it. We don't sit around trying to negotiate. We don't want to get trapped in a high-rise if indeed there is a fire. And we don't know whether there is or not sometimes, but we go ahead and follow the instructions for our own safety. With that in mind, it begs the question over and over again. When we have a book, a compilation of writings over centuries that have order and structure to them, that tell us who God is, tell us who we are, and how we are to relate to that God, why is it that this book that gives us so much detail about how to live, how to be, why is it that so often we ignore it? Don't take it seriously. Don't pay that much attention to it. Do you know there is not one occasion in the Gospels where the disciples catch fish on their own? And these are fishermen. And every occasion, Jesus is the one that makes it happen. So if Jesus is so good about giving instruction to all of us that is edifying, beneficial, life-giving, why don't we pay more attention to it? Why don't we take it more seriously? Why do we sometimes do what I do when I have something to put together, believe I can do this all by myself? I don't need instruction. Just leave me alone. I'll take care of it. Only to get frustrated and to get angry and know it's, I'm not capable of doing it on my own. You are not either. We are a people who are wayward. We are a people who sin. We are a people who make mistakes. We have shortcomings. We have failures. And the only way in which we can get ourselves back on course and follow the path God has planned for us in life is to read and absorb and take in the instructions that God provides for us that are always, always beneficial to us. There are times in the New Testament when Jesus is very clear, go do this. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, there's the Great Commission. Go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is a clear mandate. It is instruction given to us. Go and do it. And we know, we know that the world is always much better off when someone has given her or his life to Jesus Christ. When we do our part to make another disciple, the world is that much better. And with all the frustration we have regarding all the events taking place in our world, why wouldn't we go and make disciples? 
Remember, Jesus is preaching. There are 5,000 people there. There are five loaves and two fish. And Jesus says to the disciples, go and feed them. He gives instruction. And the disciples in their own way say, surely you're kidding, right? We have five loaves and two fish. And Jesus gives instruction. Go tell them to sit down and we'll make sure everybody has something to eat. And when it is all said and done, all 5,000 people have more than enough to eat and there are still 12 baskets full left over. Those baskets represent an overflow, an excess, an abundance of grace. We always benefit from the abundance of grace God has in store for us if we follow God's instruction. It's important for us to remember that we are a people called to follow the lead of God. Do what we're supposed to be doing the way God tells us to do it, not the way we choose to do it, thinking that's the best path to take. I think it's really important for us when we participate in the sacrament of Holy Communion to remember that Jesus gives instruction. Take and eat. Take and drink. When we literally taste and see and ingest the grace of God, we always benefit. We are always better off for that. Why don't we take it more seriously sometimes? What's interesting about this passage of scripture is that you will note that the gospel writer John tells us when Jesus is on the shore, the disciples don't know it's Jesus. Now, I don't get that. He's already appeared to them twice before he has, been, he has ascended to the Father. But for whatever reason, maybe it's a distance issue, whatever it may be, they don't even know that it's Jesus. But he gives instruction and they follow accordingly and they benefit as a result. See, Jesus doesn't make appointments with us. Jesus interrupts our life, and he should. I cannot tell you how many times in my own life when I have gone a wayward path and I have gotten off from the direction I know I'm to be going in that somehow Jesus interrupts my life and reminds me where I belong and to whom it is I belong. And then I follow accordingly, hopefully, paying attention to the instructions. So why would we not believe that as we go through life, that there are not those occasions where Jesus would interrupt our life and people and events and circumstances and situations and make himself known to us. And it is in those moments when we better stop and listen and pay attention because the instruction given to us is for our great benefit or it wouldn't be given to us. And why would we need instruction if we can do all of this on our own? Clearly, we are incapable of that. So we need to listen and pay attention and believe that God comes to us in all kinds of people, certain situations in which we find ourselves in life, some kind of event we're a part of, who knows? But he will give us instruction, and if we follow accordingly, we will benefit. And that's not always easy. We know that. Remember Jesus said that if you want to be a part of the kingdom of God, you got to be like a child. One of the things that I really appreciate about Jesus is that he never asked us to do anything he was not willing to do himself. So if Jesus says we've got to become like a child in order to inherit the kingdom of God, where in the world does Jesus become like a child? He becomes like a child on the cross. Remember the prayer, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit that he offers up on the cross? That was a Jewish child's prayer. It was, if you will, a now I lay me down to sleep prayer. Jesus becomes like a child on the cross. There are those times when Jesus says you got to forgive 70 times 7, an infinite number of times. Are you kidding me? Who wants to do that? Who's even capable of doing that? And then we're mindful that Jesus never asked us to do anything he's not willing to do himself. And remember, as he's hanging on the cross, taking upon himself all of the sin for all of humanity, for all of time, all of that sin, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
in the moment of total depravity, in the moment of great suffering, unimaginable pain, Jesus forgives. There are those times when doing what we are called to do and following instructions are not easy, but they are always to our benefit. Jesus says, if someone forces you to go one mile, you go the extra mile. Jesus took the extra mile all the way to the cross. What's important for us to remember is that we believe in a Savior who places before us a high requirement with regard to how we're supposed to live. The standards are way up there, as they should be. But oftentimes we lower the standards for what we think is our own benefit only to discover that when we lower the standards, we lower them to such a degree that we have gone off the path God has for us. So we listen to the instructions, and we follow accordingly, and before we know it, we're back where we need to be by the grace, the forgiveness, and the mercy of God. I always think that there are times when Following instructions can be a challenge because I know my own agenda and I know what I think I want only oftentimes to get what I want wishing I'd never asked for it to begin with. So there are those occasions in life where if we'll just listen to the instructions, be patient enough to allow God to work, maybe somehow, some way, by the grace of God, it's going to pay off. It always will if the instruction comes from the one we call Lord. Always. I remember, it's been a number of years ago now, interestingly enough, that I was made aware that Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church senior pastor position was opening up. I was very intrigued, very interested. Susan just made it abundantly clear that she was moving to Little Rock, whether I was the pastor at Pulaski Heights or not. So I went through protocol, followed the way we we're supposed to do things in the United Methodist Church, and ended up visiting with the Bishop of Arkansas about the possibility of moving to Little Rock. We lived in Houston at the time. I drove seven and a half hours up here, had a two-hour interview, and drove seven and a half hours home. And at the end of the interview, the Bishop said to me, now this was early November, I would imagine by the end of the month, we will have made our decision, if not, certainly before Christmas. So be patient. Don't contact me. I'll contact you. Great. I went home. Susan said, are you the new senior pastor? I said, well, hang on. They got a process. So November went by. All of December, not a word. All of January, except the last day. Now, I'm thinking I would know something right after Thanksgiving. It is now a month into the new year, and I haven't heard anything. And so I kept saying, listen, we got to follow the instructions. The instructions were clear. I am not to be in touch with the bishop. He will be in touch with me. I don't want to ruin this. Make him mad. But I reached a point where I thought, okay, enough is enough. This is ridiculous. Clearly, they must have chosen somebody else to take this long. He should have had the courtesy to let me know. So I'm just going to call the bishop and say, hey, what's up? Thank God I didn't. Because that very day, he called me and said, I need to know right now, you are the choice. Will you be the senior pastor at Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church? And I said, sure, bishop. I've been waiting patiently. I'm happy to... I would love to do that. And I've thought after that many times, what would have happened had I not followed instructions? Would I have blown my privilege of being the senior pastor of this church? Would it have made the bishop so angry that he would have said, we're going to move in another direction? Because he was clear about what I should do. He gave me the instructions. And thank God I did, at least that time, follow them. 
We believe in a God who longs to be in relationship with us, who wants, I am convinced, the very best for us. And so God's always willing to give us that information that enables that to happen. Our role is to take God seriously enough to listen to God when oftentimes we'd rather listen to ourselves. Those disciples, if you read on, would catch 153 fish. Couldn't even bring them in because they followed instructions. They reaped the reward of paying attention, of being faithful. And we can too, in our own way, always benefit if we don't try to do it on our own. Because we know when we do it on our own, we're going to say shucks and darn it far too often. It's easier for us in the very beginning to be made aware of the instructions, read the instructions, and follow the instructions. It's always to our benefit. Hallelujah. Amen.